Welcome back for episode two of Ask North 40. On today's show, let's talk about gardening in Washington, some good places to go fly fishing this winter, and things to consider when deciding what dog food to feed your dog. Let's get started. Share your questions with us. We'll share the answers with everybody. This is Ask North 40. Hey, Sam, uh, who should we have answer this next question? We should have, uh, where's it from? Coeur d'Alene. Okay, so call Nick. Okay. But I'd also have Fred and Great Falls answer it. All right. Yeah. By the way, this is Max from Sims. Max, we got a question on winter fly fishing. Yeah. What do you think? Where to go? Where to go? Uh, I'd probably say tailwaters below dams. There's a couple on the Missouri that are pretty good. Absolutely. So that's probably my favorite options in the winter. Cool. Ben asks, where are good fly fishing areas this time of year? Well, some of your best winter fishing is, is probably going to be on Spokane River. Definitely a tailwater. It uh, fishes really well with streamers, woolly buggers, nymphs. Um, your past rubber legs are all really good um, choices. The Coeur d'Alene, if you're going to fish the Coeur d'Alene, fish low on the system. Uh, you don't need to go very high at all, um, maybe 5, 10, 10 miles up maximum. So, Cool. Thanks, man. Well, I think you're going to want to come to Montana in the wintertime to go fly fishing. Between uh, Craig and Holter Dam on the Missouri River, we've got big fat rainbows, the occasional brown trout zilla. Uh, winter nymphing and streamer swinging produces some of our best catching of the year. In fact, I even think it's better than summer. Uh, you know, dry fly fishing is okay, but it's kind of easy when you can see the fish come out and eat your fly. I like to, you know, drop a nymph down there a little bit deeper, uh, swing a streamer at them. Uh, well, in all seriousness, it's, it is definitely good fishing. Uh, it's weather dependent. Obviously, if it's 10 below, we're not going to be out there, but when we get the 35, 40 degree days, or even more if we're lucky, we can have some great fishing. The uh, fish generally tank up in slow to moderate current waters, and if you find them and fish your scuds, your style bugs, your midges, and your smaller streamers, you can have a great time. So we got a question about dog food that came in, so we're going to give Dave over at Neutrina a call to get the answer. Sarah asks, what is the best type of dog food to feed your dog? Yeah, so there are a lot of things to consider. Um, of course, you know, I would say always consider the dog first, you know, his needs, his activity levels, um, age. But you also have to take into account your budget. Um, you know, we have, we have dog foods in the market ranging from the, the grocery store level of, you know, 12, 13, 14 dollars for 50 pounds up to you know sixty dollars for a 28 pound bag of your big grain grain free name brands so um you definitely want to know what your budget is um and then think about your dog um is it a house dog? is it you know just your lap dog that hangs out and uh you know lays on your lap while you're watching tv is it a working dog is it a show dog um because there's different protein levels and fat levels in all dog foods um so, you know, if your dog is essentially a house dog, or mm -hmm. maybe you might even say lazy, you know, lower fat, lower protein. Um, if they're super active, working, um, hunting dogs, things like that, of course, you know, you want to get a little higher protein, a little higher fat to help support the amount of energy that they're expending. Um, you know, and then there's the big, the big, uh, what we call it, um, in the marketplace right now, you know, the big fat of, of making sure you're grain free. Um, that's not necessarily always um, important. It depends on your dog. Okay. Um, you know, think of like um, um, people with gluten intolerance or a gluten allergy, right? Well, dogs are the same way. The, there, there is such a thing as a grain allergy, but probably less than 10% of the dogs, maybe even less than that, you know. Um, just like people with gluten intolerance is a pretty lower percentage um, of the actual population. So, 
um, do you really need to, to spend that $60, for example, on a small bag of grain free? Um, things you might check for, um, you know, this, this is a little gross, but think about your, uh, your dog's bowel movements. Uh, are they changing the consistency? The I'm always thinking out? about that, Dave. Uh, me, too. me too. I think about it daily. But, you know, I mean, it does matter because if there's an issue or if you've seen a change, um, maybe there's something you need to consider. Maybe your dog is allergic to something in the feed. It might not be the grain. Maybe it's, maybe, maybe he doesn't, uh, maybe chicken doesn't agree with it. Maybe you should try lamb and rice, uh, you know. Um, but if they are truly allergic, you're going to see things like uh, the dog's lethargic. Uh, definitely be itchy. And not just like, you know, scratching around his collar or fleas, but his entire body is going to be kind of dry, itchy, um, those kind of things. But really, to know for sure, that would be, you know, get with your vet, um, have a blood test done, those kind of things. But most dogs really aren't um, allergic. Gotcha. But, you know, if you see those kind of things like, like that, it um, would be a good idea to, to look into it a little, a little deeper. Um, the easiest thing before you go to your vet is to try, you know, try gradually changing the food. Okay. If you're on a grain-free, uh, excuse me, if you're not on a grain-free, you know, maybe try going to a natural, which is like uh, essentially no corn, no wheat, no soy. Okay. Uh, before you go all the way up to an official grain-free. The naturals are great, but a little less expensive than the grain-frees. Um, you know, but again, it, it has to do with your dog and your budget. If your dog's doing great on the grocery store brand, um, doesn't have any issues, he's active, he's happy, he's healthy, then then I say that's the old, if it, if it ain't broke, broke, don't fix it. Gotcha. Um, Right? I mean, if your dog's happy, there's no need. Uh, but if you're noticing something, then certainly think about looking at a, at a little higher quality and work your way up slowly, changing food slowly over the course of, you know, a week to 10 days. Hey guys, we got a question in about growing vegetables in North Central Washington. And to get that answer, we're going to go to Stefan, who happens to be an organic, wait, certified organic farmer. Shannon asks, what are some good fruits and vegetables to grow in North Central Washington? You can really just uh, run the gamut of vegetables in Northwestern or North Central Washington. Uh, personally, I've grown everything from early season greens, you know, on uh, through um, uh, garlic, you know, I planted in late fall. Uh, there's really no end to what you can do vegetable-wise in North Central Washington. Um, I would say some of my favorites and some of my recommendations would include uh, tomatoes. Um, we're lucky in this part of the state where we've got enough heat. We can do uh, those warm season crops like uh, melons and, uh, and peppers. I always love to, to grow some real nice hot peppers for my salsas. Um, so uh, North Central Washington, you really shouldn't limit yourself. If you can look for, uh, you know, seed varieties that are more cold hardy um, and have shorter uh, you know, growing days uh, to maturity. That's a good, you know, a good uh, sort of give you a, give you a little bit of a, a lead and uh, and help you get to maturity before we get to those frosts in the fall. Cool. Hey, you said there's there's no limit. Uh, what what zone? Okay. Are you? Big question here is what's the difference between growing seasons in areas like the Golden Triangle and Great Falls versus Lewiston, Omac, Central Washington region. We can look at this based on USDA's grow zones. This dictates which plants will thrive in those areas. For instance, Golden Triangle, Zone 3 or Zone 4, we have a shorter growing season. And in OMAC and Lewiston, Idaho, it's a Zone 6, Zone 7, we have a longer growing season over there. Some of the fruit that um, you know, you're, you're going to stay away from in North Central Washington are those uh, you know, citrus type fruits that just can't handle um, you know, the cold. Certainly, if they're a perennial, and you're going to leave that tree in the ground for a while, you're just not going to be able to, you know, get it to flourish. You might, you know, make it through one season or, you know, one winter. But, uh, yeah, so things like citrus, you know, limes, you know, oranges, that kind of thing, you know, you're going to be staying away from. Um, but, uh, you know, um, anything in the, the peach, you know, tangerine, apricot, nectarine varieties, those are great. Uh, in North Central Washington, it's it's kind of common knowledge that a lot of it, fruit grows here, but you just have to stay away from citrus. So that does it for episode two. But remember, we're always looking for more questions, so get them to us by using the hashtag AskNorth40 on any of your favorite social platforms. Until then.